Hello, a very good morning. Welcome along to Ireland M on Virgin Media One. It is Thursday, the 20th of June, and it's all looking good. We hope you're going to get to enjoy some sunshine today. A bit of sunshine yesterday is great. Yeah, go out there and enjoy it. Now, it's been a busy week politically from Minister of State Jack Chambers being named as the Deputy Leader of Fianna Fáil to the leadership race for the Green Party. What do you make of it all? Let us know. We're going to have political analysis at 7.15. Not even a general election called. It's all go, lads. All go. We're also going to be speaking about the shortfall in funding for cancer services. We were chatting about it yesterday. We're going to go a little bit more in depth in it today. That's coming up at 7.35 this morning. And more politics at quarter past eight. We're going to be talking to British author, journalist, podcaster, Alistair Campbell. He's going to be chatting to us uh, about the UK general election. There's only weeks to go. Can't wait to hear what he has to say on that and everything else. Yeah, the Tories look like they're going to be wiped what? out. So I wonder if he's going to have a big smile on his face. Alan Hughes is over there. Hi. Over Sorry, here. you're over there. I was we like, where over is he here. gone? There's Hi. two of us over here. Oh, you're with Brian. Uh, lots of other stuff on the show, including a burrata pasta in the kitchen. Joey Essex is making waves in the Love Island villa. And Brian is here with some recommendations. You a Love yeah. Island fan? No, no, didn't think so. Didn't think so. What are we going to be looking at today? Yeah, so uh, the Bike Riders is in cinema. Uh, the Celine Dion documentary is going to be on Amazon Which Prime. Which I can't wait. Tuesday. Myself and Mirren are going, yeah. that's definite. It's really, really good. I have to say, a lot, a lot of stuff going on in it. And then we're going to be talking about Presumed Innocent, which is the new series on Apple TV Plus that everyone's talking about. Cool. Looking forward yeah. to that. That's coming up about a quarter to eight this morning. Now, Derek is chasing the sun this morning. It's the summer solstice. Where are you, Derek? Yes, ah, well, following our trip to Dundalk in County Loud, yes, sir, we've landed here in County Westmeath, and it is quite a cloudy start out there this morning. Some light showers into northern areas, but it will improve in a fast, a nice sunshine kicking through, especially through parts of the Midlands and into eastern areas as the day goes on, with temperatures warming up pretty nicely to around 16 to 21 degrees. Now, we've landed here at the hill of Ishnock in County Westmeath. Today is, of course, the summer solstice, making it the longest day of the year. Just over my shoulder here, we have got Mother Earth. She has got us there. So we are going to be grounding ourselves, re-earthing ourselves with some of the locals. We've even roped in some local druids as well. I feel it's going to be <laughs> one of those mornings. <laughs> Happy summer solstice. <laughs> Happy summer. There you have it, lads. The summer's over. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Longest oh day of the <laughs> It's here. Her face is better than mine and she's made a rock. Uh, good stuff, Amazing. Derek. We'll catch up with you later on. Always a good laugh It'll whenever we see you out right there. Right, it's time to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Independent. Holiday flight fears mount as no plan for pilot strike talks. Dozens of flights will have to be cancelled by Aer Lingus later next week as industrial action begins with little hope of a swift solution to the impasse between the airline and pilots over pay. The headline in the examiner is also about that. Flight sales fall ahead of pilots' action. Aer Lingus bookings with travel agents have dropped by almost a third in 24 hours since pilots upped the ante in their industrial dispute with airline management. Crackdown on lost passports. A crackdown on people entering the country without passports has resulted in 100 prosecutions this year after just one prosecution in the previous five years following 3,000 airport spot checks. And that's the top story on the Daily Mail. The mirror goes with Cruz Sorry Now. Kinahan target James Mako Gately yesterday lost his long-running battle with cab as it seized his home, car and Rolex watch. Yes, the sun leads with smash and cab. Gangster James Mago Gately is set to lose his house after it was seized in a cab ride. The star also leads with the same story. You cruise, you lose. And this is in reference to the fact that himself and his girlfriend went on a lot of cruises. Uh, and the Herald goes with my going, going, gone. And finally, something different on the front of the Irish Times. O'Gorman edges ahead of Hackett in leadership contest. Roderick O'Gorman took an early lead in terms of public endorsements from the Green Party's elected representatives as the contest to become the next leader of the party shapes up as a showdown with one other candidate, and that is Pippa Hackett. And we are going to be covering the political reshuffle from the week. That's coming up very shortly. Yes, back after the short break.
Welcome back. Now, it has been a big week for politics with Eamon Ryan announcing his resignation as leader of the Green Party. Roderick O'Gorman and Pippa Hackett declaring their candidacy for leader and Micheál Martin appointing a deputy leader for the first time in four years and that is Jack Chambers. Yes, join us to discuss these latest political developments. This is Lorcan Live from the Communications Clinic and political analyst Audrin Flint. Good morning to you morning. both. Great to have you with us. Hey, Audrin, yeah, let's start off with Minister for State Jack Chambers now looking like the deputy leader of Fianna Fáil. Why do you reckon they've done this? I think effectively is to recognise what he did in the local government elections when he was director of election. And uh, against most uh, people's sort of views that Fianna Fáil actually became, still became the largest party or retained being the largest party in the local government. And they were within a fraction of getting the most popular, most number of votes as well. Mm -hmm. So therefore, um, and he's been up and coming. Jack Chambers has been sort of risen, you know, relatively quickly in the party. I was sitting beside him in a couple of studios last week and he's very assured, he's, he's very good and he's young. He is, he's 33 years old 33. and he's their version of yeah. Simon Harris, you know, young talent. But I think a lot of people would have been, they mightn't have realised that Fianna Fáil didn't have a deputy leader, assuming that it was Michael McGrath yeah. for a long time. Yeah, because look, the role of the deputy leader, like it isn't exactly the most yeah. important consequential. That Derek Leary would have been the previous deputy leader. He would have got caught up in the golf gate scandal, um, stepped away, and they just didn't replace him then as a deputy leader. So they have now decided to, with Jack Chambers, obviously was the youngest in the doll, like Simon Harris mm -hmm. was when, when he came in, in in 2016. So has been around for quite a while now, um, and so has been a relatively senior member of, of Fianna Fáil for, for quite a while. I presume the idea of, of announcing the deputy now is right. Okay, there's an election coming up, you're going to be a senior spokesperson, you are going to probably be driving the electoral strategy of the party giving you the different local elections, so let's just give you the gig. There are rumours then, does, does this speak that perhaps there's a reshuffle in the cabinet coming and that um, Jack Chambers will currently be a minister for state and is he in line for a senior ministry and therefore they want to boost their profile before that. But what does that mean? Does that have knock-on? Like, is that about Michael McGrath? Like, that would, rumors the, the, about the rumours European that Michael job. McGrath m might be taking on the commissioner job. Now those rumours have been around for a okay. while and the way it's generally been felt that if he wants it it's his but people aren't sure if he wants it and um, so if he takes that then of course if Fall will need um, another se senior senior cabinet posting and um, there's also an idea maybe is this me on Martin saying you're my man, you're my successor, you can well, be the face of the party. that's what I was because Michal Martin is riding high in the opinion polls at the minute, very mm. popular. But is he trying to stave off any challenges for his leadership by doing this, by appointing somebody who's still quite young and still maybe a little bit away from the leader of the party? Well, he staved off quite a number of challenges over the years. And remember, he's been leader since the end of 2010. At the end of this year, he'll be leader is 14 years in yeah. the fall. Um, I, I think he probably has his own ambitions. And the reality is, if you're a leader of a party in a, in a large party like Fianna Fáil, it's hard work. It's day in, day out for I mean, two, a decade and a half. Um, but could I think he have a lot made of Michael McGrath like a deputy who would have probably been a little bit closer to succeeding him? But a deputy, him? see, that, that's an assumption that a deputy actually has... A deputy to me in, in most parties is more symbolic. It doesn't mean... I mean, Mary O'Rourke was a deputy. Mm -hmm. John Wilson was a deputy. Okay. Of deputy leader of Fianna Fáil. Um, and effectively, it doesn't mean that they would step in yeah. as leader if somebody goes. It's, but not it like is a more vice captain, then, no. No, it's no. not, Tommy. It's okay, not. No, were you ever one of those? Were you? Were you no, vice captain? I was just about to say. <laughs> never vice captain or captain ever. <laughs> we could see why, given my knowledge on this. Okay, well, let's move on to the Greens then, um, because there is an option to become the leader there. It looks like it's a two-horse race between Pippa Hackett mm. and Roderick O'Gorman. Who is the front runner at the minute? I think it has to be Roderick O'Gorman for a number of reasons. Um, there are twelve TDs. If, if, uh, green TDs. The eight of them are in Dublin mm -hmm. and the four, other four are outside. And there's no real rural TDs as such. I mean, there's one in Limerick, C Limerick City, Waterford. Wicklow would be mm -hmm. the closest. Yeah. And Carlo yeah. Kilkenny, but Kilkenny is obviously a city as well. And the Greens, I mean, traditionally have done much better in the cities, but the local elections, they were badly damaged outside mm -hmm. of Dublin. They didn't do brilliantly in parts of Dublin either. Uh, and it's going to be a great See, one of the problems I have now is that neither of the two prospective leaders, A, Pepe Hackett as, only, as a senator, doesn't have a seat, and he's in a three-seat Offaly constituency line, which yeah. will not be easy. And if you look at the 
fallout from the locals for Rotary of Garma and Dublin West. I know it's a five seat constituency as opposed to a four, but you wouldn't put a lot of money on them when keeping a seat. And in fact, the only, the only ones you'd say, Catherine Martin would be the, probably the best one to keep a seat, most likely, one because it's a four-seater now rather than a three-seater. Well, let's look at that a little bit, because when it comes to the Greens, when, it com when it's name recognition, it's obviously Eamon Ryan, mm. Catherine Martin, Roderick O'Gorman. An awful lot of people might have known Pippa mm. Hackett and what it was that she did. Are, are they in serious trouble here? Like, as Audrey said there, might even keep their seats and they're going for leader. Well, look, they're, they're, they're in serious tr trouble regardless if you look at the local election results. I mean, you know, the 3% the, the that they would have got there, they got about 7% in, in the general election. So they just need to look at who are they targeting. So, I mean, like the, the Greens, they, they might be slightly over worrying about, right, what does the entire public, the entire population think of us? It doesn't actually matter what the entire public and population thinks of the Greens. It matters what the 7 to 10% of people who will possibly vote for yeah. the Greens think, which are, you know, people who care very much about the Green agenda. So I think they do have a chance here. They have a chance to reset a little bit of the fresh start that Pippa Hacker talked about, regardless of who the leader is, to say, right, they need to get a little bit more aggressive in pushing what they have done, what they have been stopped doing by government because they're only in coalition, how much further they would like to bring it, the lack of substance maybe in some of the opposition policies around climate change, and take ownership of that. So they're getting very into this Dublin rural divide. How, how are yes. we seen? But, you know... You, you want to push back on the rural uh, criticism because it's branding them the wrong way, but you want to push back so that those who care about the green agenda don't think they're out of touch or impractical. They just need to make sure they're seen as practical and that they're the ones who take it seriously. And there is an opportunity to do that regardless of who becomes their leader. Are you surprised Catherine Martin didn't push for it given that she pushed uh, Eamon Ryan very close back in 2020? Mm. I, I heard something that she's maybe stepping away for the moment because if the election doesn't go well for them, they might have to look for a new leadership and that might be the time to push into it. Would that be right? That actually is a real possibility because she, in my view, has got the safest seat of any of the green standing. In, in, when, in the, when the election comes. Um, I think the Greens at this point, and particularly having analysed the local, local results, the Greens will be doing well to come back with three seats. Wow. Um, and I suspect that there's a real possibility that neither of the two people running for election now... Are going to get a seat. Might, ..might get a seat. And therefore, Catherine Martin would be the best place at that mm. point and would have to do what Ray Ryan did from 2016 mm. uh, 2000, to, to, to rebuild the party again. It's quite interesting Ever. what you mentioned, yeah. Lorcan, just in relation to, to show people, lads, this is practical. We're not trying to take away everything. We're not trying to ruin all the fun and take all your cars away. Why can't they? Why have they been ineffective at doing this? Well, look, because it is difficult, OK? And in many ways, you need to realise that they're, they're, they're bringing through policies, they're bringing through an agenda that is really, really necessary, but that not everybody wants and does make people angry. So there is that element of it. It's not all just communication. There's, but a, very, they, uh, there's a big lobbying group against them, like globally. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think we, people will maybe see on, on primetime centre, Roisin Garvey, um, had a, a, a back and forth with, with, with Michael Healy Ray. And I thought they did a relatively good job at, at pushing for their agenda and saying, look, what you're saying is unrealistic. What we're saying is realistic. We're trying to make the transition coming true. And also, you keep celebrating our policies in your local constituency and attacking us nationally when you're celebrating what's, what's coming <laughs> through. So, But I think maybe slightly more that approach and trying to connect it to people because they are seen as out of touch and impractical they don't see themselves that way. Um, Roderick O'Gorman's first interview was all about we deliver, we deliver, we deliver. So that will be the messaging they try, but they, they but need to make it a bit more. That the three people who are in the government though this year, you had Eamon Ryan was in charge of transport. We're mm. seeing so much about Dublin Airport and transport with that. You have Roderick O'Gorman, who's in charge of immigration, which of course is a hot topic in Catherine Martin RTE. Yeah, yeah. So to be honest with you, they've been in charge of the three portfolios that have been ripped apart in the last year. Yeah, and the biggest scandals and the biggest issues. So, I mean, it, it hasn't been easy and the no. issues they have hasn't been easy. God, it's almost as though they could hire a communication specialist to <laughs> help them out a little. Uh, listen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for all of your work here today. Lorcan Lyon from the Communications Clinic and other on Flint Political Analysis. Thank you so much. Yes. Now, uh, still to come, we're going to be talking about the delays in cancer diagnoses and treatments. Yeah, see you back here shortly.
Welcome back. Now, yesterday, the Irish Cancer Society, we were chatting about this, it released its pre-budget 2025 submission. It highlighted a €180 million Euro shortfall in funding for the National Cancer Strategy. That has obviously led to longer wait times and delays for patients waiting to receive cancer diagnoses, treatment or surgeries. Yes, so here to discuss how this underfunding is affecting those patients is Director of Services for the Irish Cancer Society, Corrine Hassan. Good morning Hi, to you, Corrine. Thank you so much for coming in. We covered this in the news yesterday quite yes. frightening. Can you give us an idea how long these delays now are for people who are waiting for diagnosis uh, and treatment with cancer? Yeah, yeah, and it's quite stark, the figures, and I hope I don't kind of upset too many people because I'm very conscious that there's people at home that are waiting for tests to, to mm -hmm. happen. But an example is there's currently a 1,000 people waiting for an urgent colonoscopy. A 1,000 people for an urgent colonoscopy. So that's people who have symptoms, people who you know, are in pain, people who are maybe bleeding. And we know that there's different time frames to get colonoscopies, and four out of 10 people are over that time limit. So we're finding that people are basically on waiting lists. There's about 276,000 people who are waiting for diagnostic imaging. So whether that's an MRI or a CT scan. So people are just waiting long times to get that test to even find out if they have cancer or not. Why? Um, underfunding of the National Cancer Strategy. We currently have a strategy that is 2017 to 2026. We've had funding for two years in that, 2021 and 2022. There's also a recruitment embargo going on at the minute, um, which we just don't seem to be able to kind of get through at the minute, that we need staff. Are, is it is an issue, we talk about it all the time, mm -hmm. about medical personnel leaving the country? Uh, yeah, that's a part of it for sure. I mean, we know of people that are getting trained up here and then they're leaving to go to Australia to, to work out there. Um, but there are people in the country who do want to work and we can't we can't get them into jobs. And I mean, an example is we're aware of three hospitals that have, between the three of them, six radiation machines that are lying idle because people can't operate them. We don't have the staff there for that. So people aren't getting the radiation treatments that can save their life. That's, that's frightening. Yeah. So you have the facilities, you have the, everything yeah, there, you yeah. just can't get the people. Yeah. And what cost is this having? Because it, it's at the statistic that it's one in two people will be yes. given a cancer diagnosis. Yeah. There's a thousand people waiting for a colonoscopy. I mean, if you miss out on these treatments, how much is it impacting your chance of survival? Oh, hugely. We know the earlier you get diagnosed, the earlier you get treatment, the earlier you get surgery, you have better outcomes. And even if you then do survive your cancer diagnosis, you will have better outcomes. So it has a huge impact on your survival rates, but then also your quality of life after your cancer diagnosis. And what we're finding is people aren't even getting access to lymphedema services, to dietitians. Again, the recruitment embargo is paying a huge part in that. We'd love to hear from you today, 0896 111 if you're infected in any way uh, by anything that's because everyone is it's one in oh, two people that yeah, are going to get yeah, cancer yeah. in their lifetime when you're talking about these six radiation machines they're not cheap no they need to be expensive. serviced mm -hmm. they need to be used i don't know if you'd know this exactly like they're used throughout the day the ones that are used yes they're going full tilt right oh 100 so how many patients would they kind of get through uh typically one machine could do up to maybe 12 patients a day like, a day yeah 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 in some hospitals now depending on the different areas and, and the people that are coming in so it's quite stark to think that they are lying idle you know and, and i just distressed like we have a health service that is full of extremely wonderful healthcare yes. staff and the teams are brilliant but they're working under huge, huge lack of resourcing. They're very stretched. They're, it's very chaotic, you know, settings that they're working in. So it's not a reflection on them. It's a reflection on the infrastructure that's around them. So you're talking about a uh, 180 million euro shortfall yes. in funding. Yeah. We we were down in Limerick Hospital a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. The government have said we are throwing money at this yeah. situation. We don't know where the money is going. Yeah. So are you? So you're not getting the money here. No. Are why and why are the government not giving it to you? Do they not think that it's going to the right areas yeah. or what's going on? And, and you know, I, I wish I had the answer as to why they're not giving it. But as I say, the, the cancer strategy, uh, we asked whenever that was created in 2017, it's an ambitious plan, but it's achievable. But we did say we need at least 20 million per year to implement that. And as I say, only two years have they received that funding in 2021 and 2022. There are increases going into health service. We have to remember we've had a pandemic, we've had cyber attacks, so there is money going in, but the facts don't lie. You know, with the amount of people that are on those waiting lists, the amount of people that aren't getting to their treatments in time, you know, one in four breast cancer patients didn't get their surgery in time in 2022. You know, stark figures like that tell a different story. So yes, there's money going into the services, 
but it also seems like maybe cancer isn't a priority at the minute for the government and that's why we at the Irish Cancer Society are really calling on them to invest and to make it a priority. But that just seems bonkers when someone you're either going to get it or someone you love is yeah. going to get it yeah. and, and it's everywhere there and I'm just thinking the cost of those six machines it's 360 people a week like if you do the sums Potentially, yeah. it's unbelievable if they're doing 12, yes, 12 a day. Yeah. Uh, there was also in your submission you were talking about things and I know we've talked about it before you know nurses getting clamped when they're <gasps> working overtime yeah, in hospitals yeah. or whatever. You have made the point about car parking in hospitals for cancer Insane. patients who are sitting yeah. there all day having to have their chemotherapy. Yeah, yeah. And typically we've done a lot of work on the cost of cancer because there's a lot of hidden costs. So typically whenever somebody in a house gets a cancer diagnosis, their income drops by about 1500 a month. So you're down 1500 wow. and then you've all these little charges. So your cost to get to and from treatment. And if you're having radiotherapy, you are going five days a week for six, seven, eight weeks. Uh, so you're hit sometimes with three or 20 per hour. Um, in the hospital, you have your diesel and your petrol to get there. We've had cases where patients have become unwell or maybe their treatment have gone longer and they have gone out and also been clamped. So, you know, all those extra costs, just they all rack up. And it seems like you get a cancer diagnosis, you're trying to deal with the emotional and the physical effects of that. But then mm -hmm. you're hit with the financials, you're hit with everything else. And, and the car parking charges are just insane. You know, some hospitals have capped it um, for cancer patients, but not all of them. And some of them just haven't done anything. It's just your standard rate per hour. We had journalist Sean Defoe in here yes. from News Talk last week talking about his testicular cancer yes. diagnosis and treatment and was speaking about the amazing work and how quick he was able to get mm. in and get treated. How many people are not getting that quick treatment? Like, you, you know, is it very efficient? Like, are on 95% on of the time, are people getting in getting seen very quickly? Or is it getting worse and worse? Whenever you're in the system, it does operate a lot smoother, but it's even the getting is the problem. So getting the tests and, and people are all quite often paying private to go and get the test. So we do have inequities across the country okay. as well. You know, people who have private health insurance can sometimes get access to, to treatments that other people can't. So there's definite inequities. So that is out there for people who are willing to pay, who can afford to yeah, pay. Yeah, you can go, you can pay for private scans mm -hmm. to kind of speed things up. And again, like and as Sean said last week, whenever you're in the system, typically things do move quickly but we are aware you know radiation you're meant to have it within 15 working days of your diagnosis yeah. and, and and different you know there's different targets yeah. we're not hitting all of those and there is a worry about more and more private hospitals opening up and them taking the staff from yeah. our public hospitals because yeah. yeah. they'll go there yeah. it's it's all it's <laughs> yes there is a yeah. word for it and i'm not allowed to say it on the telly um corinne hassan director of services for the irish cancer society thank you so much thank for you. joining us we'd love thank to hear you, from you yeah. today it's 0896 triple one Triple one, there seems to be the money. We just don't know what's happening with that. Yeah, absolutely. And even those car park changes, charges, everything else. Yeah, give us your stories, please. We'd love to hear from them. Uh, lots more still to come here on Ireland. And we'll see you after the break. Thanks for staying with us now from Celine Dion's new documentary. There's a story of life of a motorcycle gang, the bike bike riders. There's plenty on this week to keep you entertained. We're here with Brian Lloyd from entertainment.ie. Good morning, Brian. It's lovely to have you here. The bike riders. Let's yeah. talk about this movie first because I've, there's been a lot of promo yeah. behind this. A lot, and lot of promo. It's like old school promo. It's all, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so uh, essentially what's going on in this is, is Austin Butler and Jodie Comer are a married couple who are members of this gang called the Vandals in 1960s Chicago. Tom Hardy is the leader of the gang. And it's really kind of, I mean, they're kind of trying to set it up as sort of like good fellas, but on motorcycles. That's really the like, kind of idea. Yeah. Good cast. Good cast, great cast. Yeah. yeah, like you almost have like Norman Reedus is in there as well, Boyd Halberg. So like great support and cast. But yeah, the year of it, it's like, you know, sort of proto-punk before there was, you know, Hell's Angels, before there was like the sort of organized crime element in motorcycle gangs. They were just like, I suppose like weirdos and outcasts who all kind of banded together. together. Who kind of came together, yeah. yeah. And it was Let's based on this like famous uh, photographic book as well. So yes. Okay. Really Let's have a little clip. I'm thinking of starting a riding club. All those clubs do is sit around talking about motorcycles. That's what we do. You don't belong nowhere else, so they belong together. But you're the man in charge. I'm John. We're the bad dogs. I'm Ben. I like you guys. Your boyfriends are getting into trouble. What the hell were you thinking back then? Nothing. I saw you scoring off with them guys. What do I need to think for? Hey, you and me, kid. 
Yeah. Love Tom Hardy. Yeah, you Love only Tom Hardy's great in everything, isn't it's, he? Yeah. It's serious grease. But that's, the, okay, right, yeah. So you think it's all like, Danny Zuko. Yeah. But it's <laughs> actually, but the thing of it is, and this is why I kind of like this so much, because it's quite aware of the fact that Bike, you know, motorcycle gangs and all that, it's all performative. Like, it's really, really performative. Like, they're putting on the hair, they're slicking it all back. Yes. They're doing the whole thing. The accent, even. Even the way that kind of Austin Butler kind of carries himself where he's, like, walking around and all the rest of it. It does kind of lean into the fact that these guys basically all, you know, rode around together for protection. Like, that, in essence, they were very much kind of performing their lives kind of thing. It's almost, in a weird kind of way, like, this... It's an element of kind of drag about it, like, you know, that sort of gotcha. way. Because, like, they came from, like, in the case of, like, Austin Butler's character, it's sort of hinted at that he came from quite an affluent background, Money. you know, that kind of way. And, like, uh, just John... Just fell in with these... Just kind of fell in with these guys, down, and, you yeah. know, the fact that he was able to reinvent himself and kind of, like, you know, wear the leather and, like, wear the yeah. bikes mm. and all that kind of stuff. Is and the then, jeopardy here between the, the gang and the police, or what, what? It's kind of the jeopardy between, like, Austin Butler kind of believes in this lifestyle and wants it to be real. Whereas Tom Hardy's character has kind of form this out of thin air like I mean you literally see him watching the wild one with Marlon Brando and he starts copying the oh, voice that's good. Oh, right, and then yeah. you're kind of like and like he's a, you know he's a father of two daughters that's and great. leads this very domesticated life but when he was with his boys he's all like on the motorcycle beating the crap out of people so it's that kind of aware of I suppose the inherent kind of falseness and you were kind of talking off air about the fact that you know you, when you look at Austin Butler and it seems so insincere it. and it's kind of that's it's a clever bit of casting because okay. his voice is so James Dean it's so deep okay but it kind of plays into the fact that none of it is actually real yeah, you did, did you like it I loved it I loved it oh, it's a right. really really smart gonna... film like performances are great four out of five four out of five okay yeah. okay fantastic yeah. myself oh lord and Warren have been talking about right. this. every time we the see trailers. the trailer we're literally going <laughs> Celine Dion, uh, I am Celine Dion, the documentary is coming out. Yeah, so this is not oh. necessarily about her music or about her career no. or even about her personal life. This is really about how Celine Dion has been dealing with stiff person syndrome. Now, she came out and admitted it in 2013, yeah. or yeah, 20, 2023, 2023, sorry. Yeah. 2023. But as it's revealed in the documentary, she actually had it for years and had been hiding it and had been taking Valium and all the rest of it to try kind of hide it up. And like, she even talks about how like there were certain uh, moments on stage or whatever where her, her, she could feel her voice cracking, but she'd quickly like put the mic out to the audience or she'd oh. like tap the microphone to hide the fact that she couldn't do it. Oh my God. And she talks about how like her mother taught her that, you know, when she was doing live performances and stuff like that, if you hear a mistake by the musicians or if you make a mistake yourself, don't don't react, don't acknowledge, just allow it to be oh, part true. of the performance. Let's let's have a look at the documentary because we're, we we're going to make you cry this early yeah, on a Thursday morning. I'm sorry. Is the sound man okay? <laughs> my voice is the conductor of my life. <laughs> have been diagnosed with a very rare neurological disorder and I wasn't ready to say anything before. But I'm ready now. Okay, oh. this is yeah. Celine Dion. She's just obviously yeah. an icon. Queen of pop. But she's one of the most quirky people in the entire yeah. world and quite funny. And you yes. know, in her interview, she breaks into song. Can, does that come That does, through? that 100% okay. does. Like, it, it's kind of annoying. I'm not going to lie. How the fact funny. that she just keeps singing, like she'll be like, having a normal conversation and then she'll just break into song in the middle. <laughs> she lives in a musical. Yeah. She lives in a musical. And like, there's even bits of her where like, she's, like, she's like talking to her two sons and then like she takes out the hoover and starts hoovering the couch in the middle of a while singing to herself while it intercuts with her <laughs> on stage and everything like that. So it's kind of, it almost kind of reminded me in parts of Grey Gardens, which is this famous documentary about um, the Bouvier sisters and all the rest of that. Yes. But um, we just we yeah. have a little clip because the world premiere was in New York right. and she made an appearance at it and it was all very emotional. Let's have a little look at her uh, at the world premiere in New York. Thank you to all of you from my, the bottom of my heart for being part of my journey. This movie is my love letter to each of you. I hope to see you all again very, very soon.
Very soon. Yeah. Will we see her very soon? Is there any positivity out well, of it? This is the thing. So she's, she has said that she's going to try to come back to do live performances in Vegas. But I mean, and I'm not giving this away, but like the final 15 minutes of this documentary, she has a seizure from stiff person syndrome. No. Like she literally is on the ground crying. And like, mm -hmm. so like you're watching, and you're thinking, okay, I get it. She can never perform okay. live again. Yeah. Like right. It's very much aware what of What are it. you giving us? Like three, three and a half I out of five. It's definitely worth a watch. I can't okay. wait to see it. Another again. star stood at Jake Gyllenhaal, Ruth Negga and Peter Sarsgaard, presumed innocent. Yeah, so this is based on the uh, film from 1990 by Harrison Ford, which was itself based on a book by Scott Turrell. Mm -hmm. Send you what's going on. This is Jake Gyllenhaal as a deputy prosecutor in Chicago. Uh, a colleague of his is murdered violently. Turns out that he was actually having an affair with his colleague before all this yeah. happened. And he is now the prime suspect in her murder. Mm -hmm. And it's all about the sort of political machinations going on because oh. the DA was himself in the middle of an election, he loses it and I can, you know, it's there's something kind of very enjoyably throwback about it. I mean, it's created by David E. Kelly, who obviously did Ali McBeal, he right, did The Practice, yeah. did Big Little Lies. Knows what he's doing. Knows so what he's doing. Each episode ends on a real cliffhanger. Real cliffhanger, like you really are kind of brought back into it. Now, well, you... David E. Kelly with The Undoing, he dragged that out. It could have been four episodes yeah. and it ended up being this? eight. This, this is eight episodes. Oh, right. yeah. yeah, and there was an awful lot about, we were talking about the female gaze yesterday with yeah. Bridgerton and obviously presumed innocent, very 80s yeah. men, women were there for no reason. They've tried to change that with this. They have, yeah. But they've... They have dragged it out. They have dragged it out a little bit, but it's interesting. Like I was watching it with my wife, and she was like, "Jake did it," and I was like, "No, no, no. The whole thing is that he didn't do it." She was like, "The whole thing is like, no, no, he didn't do it." We don't. We're not going to that away. He cheated on Root Nega. Maybe he deserves all. Who this. would cheat on Root Nega? Like, come on. You know, maybe he deserves all this. Cheating a Limerick should... woman. What are you Never. giving it? Like I enjoyed it. I, I do take your point though. It is. It is. You didn't enjoy it. Like, if you're just sitting down for a night in to watch it exactly. each episode. Or it's very kind it. of like, they, the episodes really, I think, are quite pacey, but yes, they do drag it out okay. a little bit. Three out of five. Apple out TV, out five. eight episodes. Jack, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal coming come out doing his first TV show yeah, as well. Yeah. He's doing that as always. Thank you so much, Brian Lloyd from entertainment.ie. Thank you, we'll Thank you, you Brian. And I still to come this morning. Do you know who's going to be here? Who? Political heavyweight. He's also a podcaster, obviously. Alistair Campbell will be here. Plus, we have a burrito pesto pasta in the kitchen, and we have all the latest from the Love Island Villa. Don't go anywhere. Hello, you're very welcome back to Ireland Day. Busy old hour just passed. Lots yep. more still to come. Yes, on the way at 8.15, someone who's no stranger to opinions, political pundit and podcaster, Alistair Campbell. He'll be chatting with us about the upcoming UK general election. Uh, also, maybe a bit of football. He's been talking about the football non-stop. Yeah, and sport too, yeah. Talking about getting young people into politics. Uh, and I've got a text. You have got a text. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yes, things are heating up in the villa as we've got uh, there's some savage dumpings, some serious love triangles. We're going to be bringing you all the latest from the Love Island villa later, later, later on. <laughs> there's uh, Joey Essex. I have it? got a text. <laughs> from now on now whether you're the mother of the bride balling your makeup off or sweating it off in the mosh pit we've got a makeup artist with us with all the tips on prepping priming and layering your makeup so is that it stays put in ireland it's just the rain just really, isn't what it? we need just the rain hey now alan is with mr alberto rossi this morning what are you cooking up yes alberto's here with us and he's making well well what are you making we are making bucatini with burrata and uh, broad bean pesto so bucatini it's a, is what the pasta is the spaghetti with the hole in the middle, so bucatini, you know, it's a very nice pasta. We do a nice fresh pesto with broad beans instead of the usual pine so here's and broad basil. Beans here. yeah. You have to all the broad beans. Be nice here, and yeah. fresh, a nice burrata cream on the back, fresh basil and everything. So very nice and summery. It's nice and summery. Exactly. And for the day yeah. that we have today, perfect. Looking forward to that a little later on. Now Derek is out and about. He's walking in the footsteps of high kings and druids. Where are you, Derek? Welcome to the magical hill of Ishnuk in County Westmeath. Uh, we're here to celebrate, of course, the summer solstice. And Sean, will you clear it up for our viewers at home? Today is, in fact, the summer solstice. Good morning, Derek. Today is the summer solstice. This is the day of the zenith of the sun. Like, we're in a leap here this year. So everyone has it in their heads. It's the 21st, but not this year. Today, the Northern Hemisphere points directly at the sun. So today is the zenith. The exact moment will be around 8 o'clock this evening. So if you're coming here for Ishnuk this evening for that sunset ceremony, it's well worth being here. We have many solar alignments on this hill. 
winter solstice, summer, summer, summer solstice, sunset and sunrise. It's an incredible sight to see it of gods, of goddesses, kings and queens, heart of the land, spiritual centre of Celtic Europe. People have been coming here for 10,000 years. It's well worth being here at this day, at this moment. So thank you for being here. All right, we're going to be connecting with Mother Earth a little bit later on this morning. But for now, we're in. Do not be jealous. Back to you in Dublin. I'm always oh, jealous of you. Oh, oh my God. I have just I been want sold. To go there now. We need to go yeah. to the elevation now. I need to talk to that guy again. What a legend. I love him. Um, great stuff, Derek. He's really getting into the swing of things. There we go. So, yes, the text messages uh, we have been getting a lot in saying the substance is tomorrow, but I gather it's today. I swear to God, we did actually. Very welcome back. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Independent. Holiday flight fears mount as no plan for pilot strike talks. Dozens of flights will be, have to be cancelled by Aer Lingus next week as industrial action begins with little hope of a swift solution to the impasse between the airline and pilots overpay. The headline in the examiner is also talking about that story. Flight sales fall ahead of pilots action. Aer Lingus's bookings with travel agents have dropped by almost a third in 24 hours since pilots upped the ante in their industrial dispute with airline management. Crackdown on lost passports. A crackdown on people entering the country without passports has resulted resulted in 100 prosecutions this year after just one prosecution in the previous five years. That's following 3,000 airport spot checks and the top story in the Daily Mail. The mirror goes with Cruz Sorry now. Kinnahan target James Mago Gately yesterday lost his long-running battle with cab as it seized his home car and Rolex watch. Yeah, the sun leads with smashing cab. Gangster James Mago Gately is set to lose his house after it was seized in a cab raid. And the star leads with the same story. It says, you cruise, you lose. And this is in reference to the fact he apparently went on a lot of cruises. Uh, the Herald goes with my, my going, going gone. And finally, the Irish Times leads with a completely different story. It says O'Gorman edges ahead of Hackett in leadership contest. Roderick O'Gorman took an early lead in public, uh, in terms of public endorsements from Green Party's elected representatives. As the contest to become the next leader of the party shapes up as a showdown with one other candidate, Pippa Hackett. There you have it. We were discussing that earlier on in the show, but Alan, we we're also discussing about the cancer funding and the yeah. 180 million euro shortfall in and the Karine cancer treatment. Hassan, director of services, was in from the Irish Cancer Society, and I think the, what it was important that she did say that the staff who are there and the people who are there are doing an amazing job. And I know that from first hand with my sister, my brother, my sister, long time battling cancer before she lost her her battle. Uh, well, we can't say bad, but whatever. Um, yeah. She was looked after so well in James's by Dr. Kennedy and the staff there who knew her, knew me, because I went to all her chemo treatments. And when you're in the system, yeah. it is absolutely amazing. For most it is people. Amazing. For most people. And this is no, the but, but this is the same, but like, at, I, I never saw her being denied anything no, or my brother no, denied which anything. Which is wonderful. So, which was wonderful, and I have to say that. But there are some messages that we've got in this morning that sort of... Um... Yeah, Mary, Marion, my son got diagnosed with cancer in January and had surgery and chemo, but he is now due a scan to check it hasn't spread. We're still waiting. Yeah. They'll but, have to uh, be done within th timelines. This one, my husband is on a waiting list for colonoscopy. We rang the hospital. We were told he will be seen in mid-2025. This is what... If you were being about. sent for a colonoscopy because... A doctor feared that there might be something wrong, and you were told 2025. Kareen told us there's over a thousand people, people on a waiting list. What? Like for, an emergent, for an emergency. emergency an yeah. emergency yeah. one. Yeah. So yeah. that means that a, a doctor has referred you because yeah, yeah. he fears something is wrong. But they have, the, have the, the they have the machines there, but just not the staff yeah. to run them. It's absolutely um, scandalous. We've got a message in here that says, it's shocking listening that there is a shortage of money for cancer treatment. They are throwing money at every other service except where it's needed. Now, they are throwing money at cancer. We just need to let you know, it has gone up 3,000% mm -hmm. since 2013 to 2024. The investment in cancer services in Ireland has so gone up 3,000%. Well, that's the question now. So they are putting the money in it. It's just what's happening and we heard that there are six radiography machines around the country that are sitting Can't idle. Used. Um, like it's, no, can I just give you this one, Avian? My elderly mum with ovarian cancer has been waiting since March for an urgent colonoscopy that her oncologist, her oncologist was referred for. She's in agony and stressed not knowing if her cancer is spread. This is Ireland in this day and age yeah. and we are still this. It's absolutely... 
disgraceful yeah. that that is happening. Oh, well, it is, Absolutely but it is. The money is there, but where is it going? That comes down to government. It comes down to uh, the health service Staffing as well. Staffing levels. And I'm sure our next guest will know all about government. He will certainly to deal with that. Know all well. about government. A government in a different country coming up. We're going to be talking to Alistair Campbell. We'll be back with you in just a minute. Good morning, you're very welcome back. Now, he was once Tony Blair's right-hand man, uh, so Alistair Campbell is no stranger to fast-paced world of politics. There's a UK general election a fortnight from today. I'm sure he has many views. Good morning, Alistair Campbell, how are you doing? I'm very well, how are you both? Alistair, we've got so uh, much to you. talk to you about, but obviously we mentioned there Tony Blair, you know, you worked with him. Was he your boss, like currently? Is Gary Lineker your boss on your podcast, The Rest Is Politics? <laughs> is Gary Lineker your well, boss? No, Gary Lineker is not my boss. <laughs> Gary Lineker is the, the boss of Goal Hanger Productions, which produces The Rest Is Politics. Uh, but he's a very good colleague and a very good friend. And I was glad to be on his podcast the other day, The Rest Is Football. And as a result of my brilliant punditry, it got to number two in the charts behind The Rest Is Politics. So well done, Gary. <laughs> well done to you, <laughs> Alistair. You to did. hell with to Gary you. Lineker. That's it. Uh, we have to talk to you about politics at the minute. Of course, the UK general election is just around the corner. It, I mean, it looks like an absolute landslide for Labour. Um, is there anything that you think can go against them at this stage? I actually think the thing that can go against them is the feeling that people think it's all over. Because if nobody votes, there's no change. And... I worry about these polls. I think they're ridiculous. The idea that the Tories is going to get Tories is going to get wiped out. I just, but I just don't buy it. I meet too many people who say to me, mm, "Yeah, well, I'm not sure about Labour, whatever." I also think that because the polls, I mean, there's a poll today suggesting that you know Labour's going to get a majority of over 200, etc. I just don't buy it. The, 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 uh, yes, the Tories utterly deserve to be de destroyed. They've been a terrible government over the last 14 years. They've had five prime ministers, Brexit, austerity, chaos, corruption, incompetence, lies, gaslighting and all the rest of it. But I still think Labour have got to, you know, really, really fight for this and, and persuade people that because, you know, the, 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 the population is cynical and apathetic enough. If yeah. all they're hearing is, it's all over. I met a guy in Munich the other day, um, sorry, in Berlin at the football, and he was a young guy who said, if I was voting, I'd vote Labour. I said, why aren't you voting? He said, there's no need to vote. They're going to win anyway. Well, if every, I said, if everybody thinks that, what happens? And we are going to get onto that because I think in, in um, uh, new uh, results, uh, polling from the UK, over 95% of over 65s are registered to vote and it's only 60% yeah. from those between 18 and 20. And I think that yeah. we can see that across the world that younger people yeah. are apathetic when it comes to this. But in all fairness, and you talk on your podcast with Rory Stewart, uh, the former Conservative politician, about you don't buy into these polls. But let's no. talk about what's going on with Rishi Sunak. When when he got this landslide victory with Tony Blair. He was such a charismatic man. I don't think the same can be said of Kerr Starmer. So is it about charisma in the Tory party? If Boris Johnson was there, would we be looking at something very different? I think if Boris Johnson was there, the Tories would get wiped out because Boris Johnson won an election, uh, won a referendum, since when everything has gone wrong. Uh, and Boris Johnson was exposed as a complete liar and a total charlatan, and I, I don't think the public would have him back. I think the problem for Rishi Sunak, one, I don't think he's a very skilled politician. I mean, just looking at him waving there, he doesn't look, you know, he's, you, you're not talking there, so that's not Barack Obama, is it? It's not Tony Blair. <laughs> oh. um, and, but the second thing is that he did come on the end of this four prime ministers before him, and the last two in particular... Johnson and Truss, a complete disaster. And the thing about politics, the way the Tories are fighting this campaign, it's like, oh, just, just listen to what we're saying now. Like, people are stupid, so we're going to cut your taxes. Well, excuse me, you've just put them to the highest level ever, so why should we believe you now? Um, we're going to stop the boats, we're going to get the flights off to Rwanda. Well, you've been saying that for several years now, it hasn't happened. Why should we listen to you? And the thing about Keir Starmer, likewise, I agree, he's not Barack Obama, he's not Tony Blair, he's not Bill Clinton. But I think he's, I think he's the right guy for, the, for these times. He's serious, he's solid, 
He's, he's decent. He's a decent human being who believes that politics is about public service. That's what he's done all of his life. And I just think the country is ready for that. And I wish we could get away from this idea that, you know, to become a successful politician, you've got to be able to kind of be funny and make people laugh and tell jokes. We've had that with Johnson. We've mm. got it with Farage. Let's not put those people in positions of power ever again. Well, you mentioned Farage. What's your take on him? Because it looks like he is going to stand again in the election. And get a seat. Uh, and potentially get a seat. I mean, he is a... What, however he does it, he seems to bring uh, whatever following along with him and is a contrarian. Well, he, look, he's a classic populist politician. He's in politics not to address people's problems, but to exploit them. That's what he does. That, that And there he is, smiling away like he does. And right, listen, the guy's a very good communicator and he's a very good campaigner. But what has he ever actually achieved in his life to make our country better? When he was in the European Parliament, it was all about exploiting the issue. The Brexit referendum, along with Johnson, telling all the lies that they told and the false promises that they made. And now he's moved on from that. You never, ever hear Farage talk about Brexit. You never hear the Tories talk about Brexit. They've moved on from that to the next thing to exploit. So if he does... Look, I've got to tell you, I think if Nigel Farage did get into Parliament, he would absolutely hate it um, because he'll be a... You know, let's say he's the only reform MP yeah. in there if he is, or even if you've got two or three, he'll suddenly become a lot less relevant. And when he wants to be on a plane the whole time, going off to, you know, kiss Donald Trump's backside, because that's where he's happier. Yeah, except we saw that when he was over there for the past few months, no one actually knew who he was when he was at these big uh, Republican conventions. Uh, you were obviously involved in the Good Friday Agreement, Alistair. There has been an awful lot of issues in relation to the border of Northern, Northern Ireland and people who are seeking asylum in Ireland coming from the UK. This has all got to do with the boats and the flights. Uh, going forward, regardless of who is Prime Minister, do you see tensions between our two countries, um, you know, heightening over this? Well, I think if you do get a change of government, at least you'll have a prime minister in Keir Starmer who will want to, if there are tensions, whose instincts will be to try to resolve them rather than to exploit them. I mean, we're back to Brexit, I'm afraid. The fact is, serious people like John Major, like Tony Blair, to a credit like Theresa May as well, at the time of the referendum, warned that the border issue would become a problem. It was waved away by the Farages, it was waved away by the, the Johnsons and all the other liars on the Brexit campaign. And now those chickens are coming home to roost. And meanwhile, the, the, border, the border has to stay free flowing uh, as, as part of the, 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 the arrangements of the Good Friday Agreement. Specific issues that arise then have to be sorted out between governments working together. And at least, I think, if Keir Starmer's Prime Minister, you'll get a government in the UK that will want to cooperate with the Irish government on trying to resolve this rather than trying to sort of make it, you know, back to the, the times of, well, mm. you know, you're little, we're big, just listen to what we tell you, which is kind of what I felt Sunak was saying to the Irish government. Listen, I think that the, the UK and Ireland suffer a lot of similar problems. There's a housing crisis, there's a cost of living crisis, and particularly for a lot of young people, they're becoming disillusioned with politics. And I know you've brought out a book, uh, Talks, Politics and Why Politics Matters. Uh, it's aimed at a younger generation, yeah. though. Like, why do you feel this is needed at the moment to try and actually show people the benefit of getting an interest in politics? Because I think we've got a real problem with political debate, with political education, with political the, 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 the media ecosystem that, that surrounds our politics. And I go into loads and loads of schools and I talk to kids and I get the sense that when they understand what politics is, it's not just that they're in, they find that they can be interested in it, they also know a lot more about it than we give them credit for. So, and by the way, if you're wondering why I'm a pink, wearing a pink suit there, <laughs> it's because it's the only primary colour that has not been co-opted by a political party in the history of the United Kingdom. <laughs> so, I couldn't it. wear red, I couldn't wear blue, I couldn't wear green, I couldn't wear yellow, I couldn't wear orange. So that's why I'm wearing a pink suit. Pretty in um, pink. Exactly. So I think, but but I, I really I really worry, particularly if Trump gets back, because yeah. you know America still sort of affects democracies around the world. If Trump gets back, I really worry about the future of democracy. And just take the UK. So I mentioned there, you had a situation where the last election, get Brexit done, was Johnson's slogan. Mm. OK, got Brexit done. It's been a disaster, most people recognise, and yet they're not even talking about it now in this election. Neither side really want to talk about Brexit, even though it's so important 
the consequences yeah. of that referendum are so important to the country. And what I'm trying to say to young people is I understand why you turn away from politics. If all you've ever known about politics is Johnson, Truss, Brexit, Putin, Trump, Modi, Erdogan, whatever it might be, I understand why you turn away from it. But if you turn away from it, you narrow the gene pool of people who might go into politics, and that's when you end up with the Johnsons and the Trumps in charge. So we've got to get young people not being cynical about politics. Yeah. Yes, sceptical, but not cynical. And, so, and, and the other thing I want to say to kids is that you know, I, if you were, when I was a child or when I was a teenager, if you'd have said to me, I'd have ended up having the life that I've had through politics, I'd have said you were nuts because there was no reason to think I would do that. No background in my family or any of that stuff. So I'm saying to children, you know, think about it, be curious, work hard, care about the world around you, and you'd be amazed where that might take you. And what a life you have had. You've got so many disparate interests and views. Um, you are a proud Scottish uh, a Scottish man. You were happy with the result last night, one all. But, you know, or you live in London. Is football coming home? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not. I said, I said on, I said on, um, on the rest is football. That I, I honestly do think France or Germany will win it. Um, if I had to put my life on it, I'd predict that Germany would win it. I think that England. I do think the front six of England are about the best in the world at the moment. I think Jude Bellingham is an amazing player, yeah. and he's going to be an amazing phenomenon. So they're definitely, look, they're definitely in, in with the shout. But, oh, I mean, even though if they do win, if the polls are right, it will be with the Labour government. <laughs> um, even though I can see that being quite good. Honestly, you've got, you, you, you've got no idea what it's like in England when England's football team's doing well. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> so so yes. no, I'm I'm sticking with I'm sticking with with Scotland to be hungry and hopefully get through um to the to the qualifiers oh, yeah. and, and and once they're through. I'm guessing that most Irish people support Scotland in the Euros. Absolutely, but we also need you to do a rendition of your bagpiping. Yeah. We need I can do that any time you want. You didn't tell me. I, my bagpipe oh there we are. <laughs> that was it that was in that was at Munich. That was at Munich. And a, a guy I was sitting just in front of Victor Orban. He looked very confused. Victor yeah, Orban! Oh my God! I didn't. Yeah. I don't see him clapping along with you. Uh, listen, Alistair. Let's hope that Scotland can do the job and get through to the next round as well. And who knows what way things are going to go for Labour and for England over the next month. But uh, thank you so much for talking to us this morning. Your new book, Alistair Campbell, uh, in pink, talks politics, is out now. It's thank a pleasure so to have much. you with us. Cheers. Cheers thank Alistair. you very much indeed. Bye bye. Now, Alberto Rossi, we're talking football here in Italy. <laughs> Alberto Rossi is here today to cook a creamy uh, pasta, perfect for a summer evening. And it's gone over Alan's head, <laughs> yes. Bucatini with broad bean, a pesto and burrata is on the menu. Good morning to you, Good Alberto. morning, good so morning. Italy are got through their first match. Yeah, they got through the first match against Albania, so we are still there. You know? Euro champions as well. No, no, we are defending well. Euro champions. Yeah. We have uh, a Italy little bit of... Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Maybe really? we beat England. Beat England and Sorry, penalties. but it was lovely. <laughs> it, was. It, was. It, was lovely. it was it nicer than your pasta <laughs> now don't push my head. so we have a bucatini pasta bucatini is wonderful it's like um it's like a spaghetti i was asking you what's the difference between spaghetti but the, we won't see it on it's camera but the bucatini there's a hole inside so yeah so it'll be like, like a straw, a straw. And, and technically when when you mix it with the sauce some of the sauce mix is ways inside and goes inside exactly so extra sauce oh, and, and okay. a little extra oh. bite so the pasta is already cooking, six minutes is gonna take. What we have here is we have burrata, that it's, a, you know, I have burratina, that it's a small burrata. Usually okay. when you buy burrata, yes, big, it's yeah. 200 grams. But what is burrata? Burrata, it's cheese. Uh, it's cheese. Okay. It will be like a mozzarella, okay? All so right. you make fresh mozzarella and then you encase it inside the mozzarella so it's all broken inside. I put it inside the mixer and I made a little cream. Okay. So it's just a little bit of cream. There's nothing added to it. And what okay. we do, is these are the plates that we're gonna serve the pasta in. Yeah. Okay. We're just gonna put some of it at the bottom of it, okay? So that will keep it nice and fresh. Okay, I can do that. Yeah, I'll do look this at you. Other one. Thank you. So, right. yes, chef. There you go. Yes, <laughs> chef. Yes, <laughs> chef. He's junior chef. Then yeah. we have the broad bean pesto, okay? Usually the pesto is done with basil leaves and there so are uh, inside the pine you, kernels. Where, where would I get broad beans? If, would you have these in supermarkets? You can find them frozen. 
Frozen. You can buy them frozen, oh. and they come uh, with a little shell on it, like part of it that you just pinch. But if they're frozen, they you wouldn't right need to deshell them. Would they be already? De yeah, we or? can. No, you, I deshell them, but you don't need to deshell them. You, yeah, know, you can still eat yeah. them like that. Okay. Then I have almonds. I have garlic, Parmesan cheese, oil, and Parmesan cheese as it is. Okay. So okay. here in the mixer there is one garlic cloves and uh, some almonds, not toasted, okay. okay? Because if you toast them, they go dry, okay? okay. Then we put inside uh, our uh, broad beans. How many kind of like... There grams? is 250 grams okay. of broad beans. There is about uh, 60 gra 25 grams of almonds, one small garlic cloves, like okay. this This will be a small garlic clove. Don't, don't take one that's huge and yeah. then all you taste yeah. Yeah. Is, is, garlic. Just, is garlic, okay? So this is kind of like a pesto. Is it, it is, and it is a pesto. The basil doesn't go in We're going to put the basil too, but I always start with the hard stuff first. So all you right. have the almonds and the garlic, okay? And I put it there on puree, okay? And it starts to mix. Okay. Then we're going to put inside the basil. So that's still quite coarse there. Yeah, it stays quite coarse. And yeah. then once you start to put in the cheese and the basil, oh, it go a it bit better. Yeah, exactly. Okay. No? So now I put in the basil, then I have the Parmesan cheese. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good stuff. And then we put in some of our oil. Okay. Now it is not as a, it's a different flavor. Uh, you know? Yeah. It's more creamy than would be loose. You know, the pesto usually is just, uh, you know, have the pine nuts and you have the basil leaves yes. and a lot of oil. Here there is a little bit less oil, you so know. So the broad beans are being used instead of the pine nuts, are they? Well, almonds and that, yeah. Oh, yes, and course, it, it yeah. gives a little, it, it gets a little bit different, okay? It only takes a minute. And would nice you and normally fresh. put in just one clove of garlic into that? Because I found I made pesto and it's too overpowering Yeah, just put in a little bit of garlic, yeah. because also it sits there and it takes over everything. Yeah, it does, yeah. You know, now, garlic, the garlic can be funny. Is this uh, the, the oil you use in the hotel, or is this something this is the you use the, well, like, This is the use that we use in the oil. There's so many different olive oils out there, isn't there? There are, there are. And what we do here is, uh, this is monocultivar is from, uh, is from Genova, so we're from Liguria, and it's not as peppery. A lot of the times uh, can be overtake, overpowerful. But you see, if it, it's an extra virgin olive oil, even if it was a supermarket brand, is that the same as... No, you, you, have, you have it different. There's different styles, there's different olives. You know, it will be like uh, fruits, okay? You have all different kinds of oh, olives, okay. and every olive gives a different flavor, okay? Oh, right, okay. But, you know, the, the one that... You know, is, there's no point going mad and spurge yeah, on olive oil, oil expensive. Expensive. unless you go to Even Italy or Spain and you get it yeah. there, exactly, yeah. you know? So you've obviously put in more oil into Yeah, that. just What's a little bit more oil to see more, more cream. Look, this is what you're looking for. It looks almost like a little paste, okay? Yeah, it's All not right. that... Uh, okay, it's, it's very... But this is going in there now, is it? Yeah, it's going in there because then we're going to mix the pasta in here with it, okay? Oh. So you just put a little bit of the pesto in the bowl, okay? So the pasta comes out now and goes in there to Exactly, there. yeah. Lovely. Okay, so the pasta is there nice and cooked. What you do is you want also some of the cooking water from the pasta. Remember, we, yeah. do, we always have that trick. To help Exactly, so if you lift it like this, the water will be part of it, okay? okay. And that's it then, is it? You just mix it. And, and then you mix it, okay? Mm. And the water is going to make it go a little bit more creamy, like that. The smell wow. is gorgeous. Yeah, and, and the whole point is it's to have it nice and fresh, you, you see? You don't have to go, okay? And then wow. you take your pasta and you put it on top, on top of your burrata oh, cream. Oh, wow. Okay, so that becomes part of the sauce because one looks oh. at the pasta and says, oh, it's not creamy enough. But then, yeah, when you mix it with the burrata cream, it makes a difference. And oh, then wow. here, I did uh, a little bit of parmesan mixed with basil. So it becomes like a basil mm. parmesan cheese. Okay. Oh, I'll burn. And that's it. Oh, it's so that good. looks. And you can start it? to smell it. Yeah, it? that's and it. So the cheese, you're not going to put anything else. No, over because that. I already put the cheese here, here with the mixed with the basil, so um, it takes the fa the flavor of the basil. Wow. Wow. Oh. You, know, you want to move away from the heavy sauces when it's summer. You want something that's light, refreshing, and it doesn't sit on your stomach. You oh. mix it with the burrata, it's I'm fantastic. I'm going to make this. This is delicious. That's, That's so love simple. This. Very simple. You know, three, four ingredients, and you don't have to mess about in the kitchen. That during summer, nobody wants to do it. Alberto Rossi from the Inter Intercontinental Hotel, thank you so no much problem, for No problem, no problem. Absolutely oh, delicious. Is gorgeous. Up next, up. Derek is mar marking the summer solstice in County Westmead with some druids on the high, on a high hill. Oh, gorgeous. Stay with us. Go on, Tommy. <laughs>
Welcome back. Now, Derek is getting spiritual this morning in Westmead. Yes, he sure is. He's meeting some pagans and druids and learning how they celebrate the summer solstice, which is happening today. It is happening yes, today. not tomorrow. You haven't seen today. this, lads. What, are you ready? Okay. Derek, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> the things we do to keep you entertained. Look, I've lost my trousers and everything. We're barefoot anyway. <laughs> Welcome down here to the Hill of Ishok, one of the most sacred sites in the country, broadcasting live from County Westmead. Sean Clancy is with us, our local druid. Good morning to you, Sean. Good morning, Derek. How's things? How are you, Sean? Not too bad. Thank you for joining us here for the summer sauce. Yes, it is wonderful. Now, the guys were just explaining back in studio, many people think tomorrow is the summer solstice when actually in fact it is today it is today like we have it in our heads it's the 21st just from tradition but it's actually not it's the point of the zenith of the sun is today the northern hemisphere will point most directly at the sun at around eight o'clock this evening so today is the solstice it's a day forward of course because we had the leap year this year so we forget that but the the whole year rotates around the leap year but thank you for coming here today one of the most sacred sites of the land if not possibly the most sacred you mentioned yes it is a sacred place why is it such a sacred spot here Sean? Well for 10,000 years people have been coming here in tradition for celebration. We crowned our kings here, we crowned our queen kings here, our queens here. The kings of the land lived here in the great palace of Ushnok. We have the gods of the land came to rest here. Eru, the goddess for whom this land is named, who gave her name to Ireland. She rests here on a, under a stone known as Isle of Mwern. The, god, the good, good god Lu, the great god of the two of the Danon, he rests here as well as did the Dagda. The all gods associated with fertility and the growth of the land and of the triumph of the sun and so it all ties in wonderfully to this time of year and this day. But today as well, we have solar alignments on the hill. From the summit of this hill, the sun this morning would have risen over another sacred hill known as Sleeve Nagalyak, the Hill of the Witch, Loch Crew in County Mead. A direct line, you can almost draw a dead straight line on Google Maps if you needed to. That marks a solar alignment that would have stood out to our ancestors thousands of years ago. And likewise, at the winter solstice, the sun rises over another sacred hill, Crohan Hill. And then tonight, when we have all the people here for the Francis to tell you about, the sun will set behind uh, Schlieve Bawn in County Roscommon, back in alignment to the ancient capital of Coduct, uh, Rat Crohan. And that's another uh, critical sacred alignment. So all these things tie in and draw the people in and they feel that energy here when they come to celebrate. Sean, you were telling me earlier on the difference between the Hill of Tara and the Hill of Ishnok. What is it? Well, Tara was a seat of sovereignty, of, say, the... the political power of the High Kings. But to be a true High King, you had to be proclaimed here at Ushnok first, at Bialtna, when all the tribes and the kings would gather here. The provincial High Kings would proclaim the High King. He then had to go to Tara to be crowned in the Leofoil, that great stone that we still see that would cry out at the touch of a true High King. But then to be the true High King, you had to come back here to Ushnok to be crowned in spirituality, to be married to the land. And that happened here at Al Namurn on the resting place of Eru, this great festival known as the Banish Rigi. All right, we'll come back to you in a few moments time because we're going to pop over here to Francis. Good morning to you, Francis. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be down here this morning. Uh, there's a lot happening here later on this evening. Tell us what's going on. There is indeed. We will have um, quite a number of people come and join us this evening to celebrate the summer solstice. So we will all walk up as far as the summit and we'll have storytelling. We've got a beautiful harpist coming to play um, as the sun sets. And then we will also recognise World Peace and Prayer Day. Yeah, you were telling me earlier on you had this lovely connection with the Native Americans over in the US. Yeah, so we had in, I think it was, yeah, it was 2001, there were, I think, five different tribes arrived over to celebrate world and, and raise awareness for World Peace and Prayer Day. On horseback? On horseback. Yeah, We've they got were up around the hill here. Yeah, up around the hill, all bareback on pie balls. It was great. And there are images of them uh, going through the village in Loch Valley um, with tractors and old, you know, kind of old cars. And, and it was just, it's surreal, it's some of the photographs. I must share them with you. Uh, Francis, a lot of spirituality connected to today, right? Absolutely. So here um, we would be very aligned with um, Mother Nature. Um, we, would, we would be very aware of, of spending time in Mother Nature. And as this, as this event kind of grows, um, a lot of people will turn to us and travel from northwest, south and east to come and join us uh, on, on the solstice. And it's all about reconnecting, I suppose, back to our pagan, our old Christian roots. It is indeed. It's, it's very much, um, 
it's very much, you know, it, it's about the environment, it's about sustainability, it's about what's around us and being aware, an awareness, I suppose, um, more so than anything. And however you celebrate that is perfectly fine. Um, but people love to come here. And from the summit as well, we can see over 20 counties you know, in Ireland. And if you know where you're looking, you can actually see the top of Crow Patrick. Now it's teeny weeny weeny and you have to know where you're looking, uh, but you can see it, it's been said. And yeah. there's about three or 400 people expected to gather down here later on this Yes, evening. yeah, yeah. We're really looking forward to it. And, and the Hill of Ishak, you had the fire festival quite recently too, right? We did, we had the Bialtana Fire Festival where we welcomed over 5,000 people to the hill on the 10th of May this year. And um, that was, Incredible. Really special. You can follow them online. Right, Sean, I believe as the head druid, you're going to lead us out with a little bit of a chant to celebrate the summer solstice. Take it away. Just to draw in the energy of the last of this summer sun, to draw in the peace, to draw in the light, to bring on the harvest, bring on the growth. Imbas, imbas, imbas. Take our shoes off and get some grass. Pants as well. Yeah. <laughs> take our Sorry, shoes Tommy was going off. to do it. <laughs> if you're going to get into it, you got to take. Some Maybe in the next hour, if we find you an overcoat, <laughs> will we convince you to do that? Happy summer solstice to everybody. Absolutely, and thank you, Derek. Honestly, I, like seriously, there are just some mornings. That no words. No. There's just no, no words. He was there interviewing <laughs> Ken Doherty and Robbie Fowler yesterday. And then and he's then dancing in a field with no pants you know and no socks Amazing. or shoes. The world can be a tough place, but Derek, I think, makes it a much happier place. Thank you so much. <laughs> he does up. for us every he morning. Does. Anyway. <laughs> uh, coming up in the next hour on Ireland AM, from setting sprays to primers, we've got a makeup artist here to make sure your look stays on all day. And we have cosy and colourful combos on the catwalk. And the latest from the Love Ooh. Island Villa. Humba. Uh, Humba. <laughs> now it was a great day for the Irish at Royal Ascot yesterday, and I think we're gonna we've, we're back in a winner for Ladies' Day today. Oh my too. God! Sure, she had to buy two extra seats for the oh. hat box alone. We are of course only talking about Virgin Media Sports. Ger Tracy, look. morning, Ger. Oh look at that. Look at it, it's a terrible job, guys, but somebody has to do it, somebody has to come here, and it was me, thank God. I've got, uh, I've got my money on you to win Best Dress yes. Today at Ladies' Day. How are you getting on? Thanks, Tommy. I think you're way too kind. Well, welcome to Gold Cup Day at Royal Ascot. The sun is shining, and where else would you want to be for one of the most prestigious races with one of the biggest prizes in flat racing? Now, there's a real Irish interest in this one as the King of Flat, Aidan O'Brien, he goes head to head with the King of Jumps, Willie Mullins. What an exciting race in store. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by David Jennings from the Irish Racing Post. Look at David. But this is going to be a wonderful race. Let's start with Aidan O'Brien and Kiprius. Obviously, the favourite. He's won it before. Can he do it again? Ah, he certainly can. He's favourite. Uh, we, we thought this horse mightn't run again because he got injured last season. He won the race in 2022 and he's a real battler and grinder. You might think he's beaten in his races, but he always finds plenty off the bridle. He's favourite for a reason. He's trained by a master who's won the race so many times with Yates in the past. Uh, he deserves to be favourite. And it is an interesting dynamic to see, as you say, the king of flat. Aidan O'Brien, 400 Group 1 winners, his 400th yesterday here. Uh, Willie Mullins, who dominates Cheltenham every year. And they're colliding on the biggest stage of all. Ireland's probably the best two trainers Ireland will ever have clashing in the big race today. Willie Mullins has got Faubon, who I think has got a massive chance as well. What an occasion. Oh, what an occasion. And let's talk about Willie Mullins and Vauban. Clearly, the Cheltenham Gold Cup wasn't enough for Willie Mullins. Can he do it today? Oh, Willie could win anything, so he could. I'd say if he ran the London Marathon, he might win at Willie Mullins. Uh, he, I think he can. I think he's a big price. He's drifted out to about 7-1 to one now. Um, he won the Triumph Hurdle at Cheltenham a couple of years ago and he went to the Melbourne Cup and there was a big Irish interest in the Melbourne Cup last year 
and he ran really disappointingly. But Willie has had this race of mine for Vauban all season. I thought he ran really well at York on his prep for this race. Colin Keane, the multiple Irish champion from Trim and County Meath, uh, he takes the ride. Big day for Colin. Super, super jockey. I'd love to see him show people over here just how good he is and what we see day in, day out in Ireland. And I think he can do it. I'm with Vauban. So, are putting you on the spot, is that who you're going? I am with Aubon, yeah. I thought the run at York was really, really promising. Um, he won at this meeting last year, he won a handicap. He's a real battle-hardened horse, and at the prices, you know, Kiprios is obviously a short price favourite. He is the most likely winner, but I'm going to take a chance on Vauban. I think he's got a cracking chance. Brilliant. Now, David, what makes Royal Ascot so special? Oh, just look behind us here. It's just a magical place, so it is. It's like you see people coming through the turnstiles every day, and it's like the best of the best. It is like an amazing amphitheatre. Yeah, Cheltenham is so different, you know, it's colder, you know, people are dressed up in their tweed here, everybody's in their finery, and it's just, uh, it's a remarkable place, and it mightn't just have quite the same atmosphere as Cheltenham, because it's a little bit different, but, uh, you know, it's the best flat horses, it's the middle of summer, it's sunny look at us here, what a job Oh, look, and it doesn't get any better than this. David, thank you so much for joining us. Well, guys, look what we have in store today. Such an exciting day. And if you're not as lucky as us to be here at Royal Ascot, don't forget that you can watch all the action live on Virgin Media 1 today from 1.30. Of course, we're going to be looking at the horse racing. Well, Tommy will. Well, I've got I'm not... bomb. Yeah, sorted. <laughs> he just did that, that right now. I'm not really interested in the old horses. Wouldn't have a clue, Ger. I am interested in the fashion. I have to talk about your hats. I have been stalking your Instagram. <laughs> did you, what's the story with the hat box? Did you have to get it made to get the hats over there? Well, oh, I'm so lucky, Mirren. Like, it does take a village to get ready to come here to Royal Ascot. And Magella from Crevation Designs, she made all my hats. I rented them for her. But they wouldn't fit on the plane, so they had to go in the hold. And you know yourself, if you're putting hats in the hold, it's dangerous. So she got a box custom-made in Belfast so that my hats could go in the hold. And they got here, thank God. Because as you know, at Royal Ascot, if it's so strict with the dress code. If I don't have a hat, I'm not getting in. Well, listen, Ger, we are delighted that they let you in. You look absolutely fantastic. Hope you have a wonderful day. I know you're having a wonderful week. And whatever about the fashion which you've knocked out of the park, it's going to be the Irish horses uh, coming home to roost today as well. So brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. If See the you, hat's Ger. not on, you're not getting in. No, New no. bouncer thing. Absolutely. Things. I didn't know that. Uh, now, Alan, what's uh, coming up next? Well, Tommy, it's all the latest juicy gossip from the Love Island Villa, from breakups to bombshells. We've got it all covered after this break. Do, 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 do. Now, it's been another dramatic week uh, for the Love Islanders with this year seeming that it is the summer of love triangles. Uh, joining us to dissect all the latest drama from the villa as podcasters and Love Island fans, Orla Condon and James O'Hagan. Good morning to you Good both. Morning. Orla, Thanks. love triangles. A lot of people getting it on, a lot of dumpings. It's been a pretty epic it's, week. That was a pretty good round up there. <laughs> <laughs> we had a Love big twist. And dumpings. We've had a recoupling, we've had a dumping, and we had two new bombshells last night. So it was a jam packed week, and it's only Thursday. This yeah, it's only Thursday. Really Let's have a quick, a quick recap of the week. I know one of the girls, Grace, we was, yeah, I guess seeing each other, had gone. What do you actually you think you're looking for, though? Um, well, I'm look, looking for you, aren't I? <laughs> All right, I'll no, you Jess. No. No. I am. Yeah. I'm done. No, I get that. I'm getting on the day words tonight. I think the fact that we did have something on the outside that we've been able to rekindle in here is pretty special. <laughs> So the boy I would like to couple up with is... Joey. Okay, right. 
Orla, what was that? What happened? That was a load of performance art, is what you saw just there, I think, from <laughs> Joey. Looking very upset after a decision he made had major ramifications. <laughs> Joey uh, was obviously a big, big star coming into the show. People had their eyes on him. And last week, we saw a former flame of his enter the villa as a bombshell grace. Mm -hmm. We saw this brand new twist, which was the sleepover, where the new bombshells got to pull someone from the villa for a sleepover in what I believe to be Casa Amor, but off, saying, off right? from the main villa. We had a recoupling that saw them get together, which sent his former partner Sam home. And that was Joey there trying to pretend that he was very heartbroken about this and very hurt and he felt real guilt. I'm now you're, buying say, you're a second saying of it. pretending. That is my belief, James, Alan. You, yes. Do you think the same that, like, come on. Joey Essex has been on more reality TV shows. He knows what a producer of these shows wants. Do you think that? Yeah, 100%. I, I think he is giving them what he wants. I think that, you know, the relationship that he'd had with Samantha over the last couple of weeks, it hadn't felt like he was totally invested in. He kind yeah. of was just like, yeah, she was good crack. They felt like they, they were having fun together. They were having a laugh. But I think that she was a bit of a placeholder. And it's clear that the second Grace walked in, he was like, OK, right, I can, I can get on to yeah. the real stuff now. <laughs> yeah. Did she believe that it was a bit more serious than Joey did? Was she invested in him, but he I, wasn't? I believe so. It back? I believe. I believe not only was she invested with Joey Essex in the in the villa, but actually was an enormous Towie yeah. uh, fan. Anyway, I've been a right. huge fan of Joey Essex. So I think like for her, the fact that Joey Essex had walked in and swept her off her feet was kind of like her dreams coming true. But is this not the same with all of them? Then it's like, are they a bit starstruck? Oh, there's definitely an element to that for sure. Like there's definitely, I mean, all of these people would have watched mm -hmm. him on Towie growing up. He's a very familiar face to people who enjoy reality TV and live in that space. So there's certainly an element to that. The boys kind of see him as the, as the top dog. The girls see him as the most achievable prize. And that's the but, role he plays. Uh, so, but it must have been tough for her because she was coupled up with him. All of a sudden his ex-girlfriend comes in. He ditches her, goes for the new girlfriend. And then she gets dumped. The initial girl gets dumped. Yeah. Like that's pretty but, brutal. It is yeah. brutal. Let's have a look at his reaction after the dumping. About the skin I'm in. Ew. It's not oh, save it, mate. Sorry, save it. You stay true to yourself, babe, exactly. the whole time. I know you need to speak to her. I've been with a girl for two weeks. Just leave me with the girls. Like, remember what? I'm, I've spent two weeks with you. Like, well, I don't want to hear it. Skydiving. Okay. I think he's just from Liverpool. <laughs> Liverpool. <laughs> um, right, so obviously he's upset somebody, but this is what you got to do in the in the show. It's, look, it's what you got to do, you know what I mean? I, I, My thing is him saying, well, I spent two weeks with you. Didn't stop you from getting back with your ex nice and quick, didn't yeah. it? Like, you know, it just, it felt but like he was taking... Find love. But, but, was he oh, saying it, love, two weeks is only two weeks, we shouldn't be too hung up on... I, I think weeks. Joey just wanted his place in this storyline, to be honest. Yeah. I don't think... And, and that's not to criticise him. He's a reality TV star. This is his job. He's been paid money to be here. Like, I don't blame him for acting like this. But it did feel like he was just trying to insert himself in this narrative. And, and afterwards, talking to his new partner, Grace, talking about how upset he was. And she was even like, all right, I don't want to hear it. Like, why are you talking? It was yeah. kind of strange. Yeah, and I, th I think in that moment as well, it kind of was more about Samantha. And I think yeah. that her frustrations over the preceding couple of days maybe had been more about the fact that her opportunity at yeah. this sort of once in a lifetime thing that is Love Island had sort of been, I suppose, just used by Joey Essex as a placeholder moment until he could start his real experience in there with his former flame, who, you know, yeah. if you're a conspiracy theorist, you may suggest was a plant. <laughs> no. Not us, well, not, not us, not, not us. No, no, not us. Was, she, she's got leaves. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the only triangle, love triangle because we have Ronnie and Harriet and Tiffany. So tell us about this. Ronnie two. needs to be studied. Like, I don't know how this guy is manoeuvring through his behaviour. He's not even the best looking of them. Zero ramifications mm -hmm. for fairly poor behaviour. Like, these girlies, they talk the talk in the dressing room. They're really strong women. They're really backing each other. But when it comes to these face-to-face -face conversations with the men in the villa, they're not letting them have it. And by week three, I was really They're hoping... They're not putting Maura Higgins on it. They no. need to oh, channel their inner Maura <laughs> yeah. and go for it. Because Ronnie is having far too easy a ride in here, I think. Yeah. You 
or, or not. But so he's now in a love triangle with Harriet and Tiffany. Is yeah. that a different girl from last week? Sure though? is, yeah. Tommy. Sure yeah. is. Well, I, I would argue he has never he he has never personally been in a love triangle. The girls might have felt that they yeah. were in one. Okay. But I don't think he he's doesn't really realize that. No, this no, is no. A love or he hasn't. He has no interest in either. He definitely seems more taken with Tiffany than he has with Jess or with Harriet. But for I think sure. only because Tiffany has not spoken a huge amount. Well, that and there's no one new for him to be like, oh. he's playing the field. He's looking for love. You know, you got to try all the different... And just yeah, but you need to, if you're trying the all the pies, way. you need to finish a slice. You know what I mean? Like, you can't, oh, just, yeah. you can't just look and then look and then look. And then, you know what I mean? You got to, like, stick with it for a couple of days. Like. Is okay. this not the problem with Love Island, though? Like, you're always waiting to see what next bombshell yeah. comes in. It's 100% that And speaking that of bombshells, two did come in last night. Two new bombshells. Yeah. We got a new girl and a new boy. They so we came have in. Matilda and Connor spelled with K. Spelled with K, <laughs> yeah. Spelled with K. Um, they came in and they're going to be doing the the kind of uh, dinner date that we've seen over the years. Yeah, so we it was beforehand it was given that the two bombshells were coming in and they were they've chosen three people to make a starter a main course and a dessert yeah now yeah. really interesting selection of islanders as yeah. well for the dates i think matilda is playing a smart game yeah. she's looking at the she open players strategy. and she's pulling those and i think connor is just going for who he likes which yeah. is a bold move. even though they're coupled up yeah. yeah like there was there's options on the girl's side of people who are very much single and open to it and he didn't go for those so what do we see in this year james like like, is there much drama? Is like, is it's a good year from everyone who speaks about it? Yeah, I think that there's what a lot. What is it? What is there's it? There's a lot really of drama, good? and I do think it is fun to watch this sort of like dynamics emerge between the different couples and see kind of you know where you maybe get that sort of delusional individual who kind of feels things are going on more. Like that's great to watch, but you also want to see some actual love developing. And it's I do early think early though, isn't I it? Do, I don't. You want to see sort of stronger couples. Nicole developing. and Kieran are pretty strong. I, I feel like because. Joey Essex is taking up a lot of the air in the room. We're not getting mm. to spend time with like Io and Mimi or with uh, or Kieran and um, Nicole. Nicole to be able to kind of see their stories develop more. Now maybe they're just not that interesting. That That's could usually what happens though, <laughs> yeah. right? Like yeah. when they fall in love, well, we get bored and we don't want to see it. How many so. more weeks is there? We're only week three, so we should have five weeks left. Five weeks. <laughs> okay. 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 Oh, no, don't get carried away, guys. Oh, we're up already. <laughs> Orla, James, the, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you the full cake for the minute. Thank and you, guys. Of course, course, you continue to watch uh, Love Island on Virgin Media 2. Welcome back now. It's fashion time, and today we're decking ourselves out in some comfy clothes suitable for day to day. Yes, stylist Lorna Waitman is here to show us how to stay stylish, whatever you're up to. Good morning to Good you, morning to you both. Let's get straight into it. So, uh, Ursula's up first. Ursula's up first. And khaki green has ha is having a bit of a moment. Sage green, olive greens, all different kind of hues of the same colour are really making a bit of a, a, a statement this season. But to marry that up with comfort, the volume kind of aspect of the trend is still very much here. We've been talking about that over the last couple of weeks, actually, how we've got less fitted with some of our clothes. Mm. And it's a real kind of play on trend at the moment. But this dress kind of encapsulates everything. And it's from Casual Company. And the style of this, what I have to emphasize, is that it has like a ribbed effect all through it. So what you find is that the fabric is slightly heavier, so it hangs really nicely on your body. So even though you have a little bit more of a loose fit, it hangs really beautifully on you so you mm -hmm. still have that lovely flattering silhouette and any dress that comes with pockets is a winner for me because I just feel like I don't know it kind of completes your look and when you're standing you've got somewhere to put your hands and I love pockets and everything and this dress also comes in a couple of different colours as well so if you want to kind of go brighter or what darker so you've got black oh, which right. is a great one yeah. and what I do love about um, this style dress is it's a great base layer so if you want to layer a jacket over it a blazer course, yeah. smarten it up there's a hundred different ways you oh, can yeah, do you that. Can belt it, do whatever you belt, want to do with yeah. it. Exactly. But for the day that's in it now, we'll need the flip-flops, hopefully. The sliders. The sli yes. sliders. 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 And because we are just getting some nice weather, mm. I hate to jinx it, we've gone with sandal. And also, these have a little gold stud on them. So you've got that lovely marriage of like khaki and gold, which actually are two colours that work really beautifully together. And also, when you have, you're styling this look, because it's kind of a paired back look, accessories will really elevate it and lift it. And you've so got looking for details there yeah as well. earrings and also what i think if you are going earrings and and necklaces are really where we're at at the moment and this kind of double layered necklace is great with this dress because it has a lovely kind of base to sit on 
so you can actually like have a lovely color where the jewelry kind of moves it nicely and you can actually set it mm. so you can see it a little bit more rather than being against skin so if you're higher neck thank don't you. be afraid to go with the jewelry thank you beautiful ursula. thank you ursula uh, our next look is danielle today so, look danielle. number two we were hinting at the return of dungarees and overall look earlier on in our tease, Alan. And this look kind of does everything for you because it's like a, a, a pop-on outfit. So if you want to move away from the dress look, but you want that lovely, soft jersey cotton feel, then this is what this will do for you as well. But I love an outfit. As a, a new mum, I definitely appreciate the speed of getting dressed in the mm. morning and a jumpsuit. And casual during exactly. The day. And you feel comfortable and you're able to move around no matter what you're up to. And this does all of that. And mm. also, I particularly like that the seam is like more of towards an empire line. So it's going to sit just kind of halfway down your rib cage, which is a really flattering spot for it. And then also, you've got a little bit more room on your hips. So when you sit down or you're moving, yeah. you get that extra level of comfort. Your pockets. You've got your pockets. Yeah, pocket. I know. And See, you have everything in pocket is well. really good. Also, because you've got like a nice, Great um, you know, balance of you know skin versus you know the cover up because dungarees actually cover a large proportion of your body as well. So runners work really well with this. But you could put another little sandal with it too. Oh yeah, and yeah, really of course. Make it, exactly. And then for earrings, because you've got a little bit more skin towards the top of your body, you can actually see your earrings a little bit more. And I do love how you can just, you know, bring it up or down depending on what you're doing during the day. But all of these outfits from Casual Company are just such great daytime looks. Lovely. And comfort being the emphasis as well. Thank you so much, Thank Danielle. You. I think Hannah. we're going with another one with Hannah, aren't we? So we, we got saw a little this earlier on. Yeah. So if you like kind of tracksuit material that's a little bit heavier, a little bit warmer than you're going to love this. It's the Scandies always do jumpsuits really well without they making do. you look like a big baby. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like they do. Exactly. And that's, we, we haven't embraced it so much, but we're starting to. We're starting, we're starting to see them everywhere. To. Yeah, exactly. And we also, were even saying earlier on that if you belted this, you just have a totally different look. You could. Belt or something. Yeah, and yeah. you can style it up to make it your own as well. And actually, it's a really, the, the seam on this sits really nicely and kind of lends itself to being accessorised too. But also it is a lovely fall down the back. I prefer to definitely look for jumpsuits and dungarees that have a really nice kind of flat finish to the front so that you feel like when you stand they're kind of just elongating your body nicely. Yeah, they're not grabbing you in a place you don't exactly. need to grab. Exactly, you yes. said it. Yes, Absolutely. exactly. This one also has some very clever seams around the pocket as well and also around the really deep V neckline. Yeah. So it's great for layering something underneath. So we've got this little sleeveless tee underneath, which I have to say, they are such good quality. They're so soft. I'm actually wearing the black version of it oh, today as well. Okay. Super, super soft. I like the seam around the neck, Isn't it actually. Lovely? It's really subtle. Yeah, I love it's that. great. It's and you can create different looks with each of these pieces, yeah. which I particularly like. Um, and staying with the runners again, you can notice that these just finish above your ankle. So they're great with a trainer. And I like that you can see a little bit of your ankle as well. So it breaks up the outfit quite a lot. And also the, this outfit comes in lots of different colors as well. So you can have a look on the website and take a look at those. Love Some little uh, earrings oh, as The well. earrings, yeah, exactly. So we've got some gold here seems to be a big theme at the moment, but also when you've got a cooler tone of an outfit, like this kind of pinky mauve shade, gold is great with this because it warms up the overall tone of the look as well. Okay. Lovely. You look so Thank comfy, Hannah. Much. Doesn't she? Well, I think that's yeah. the idea all this morning, isn't it? It is. So it is about yeah. comfort and definitely oh, when, now there. when you're there you go. This look is so it. elegant, yeah. isn't it? And also, I just love the fit and the cap sleeve. There's so many different things about this jumpsuit that I love. Very 90s bodysuit on top, comfort Isn't on the bottom, it? where with you, you can do loads with it. Yeah. Exactly. I always recommend, you know, when you're you're dressing where you might have a bit of volume, is to stay fitted on the top and have the volume on the bottom or else reverse so it. it. Is slightly pleated. Yeah, this, yeah, it is. So you've got a really subtle gathered pleat around the waist. So what that'll do is really be flattering around your tummy and your hips too. But then you've got this almost like fitted t-shirt effect on top. But I do love looking for details like cap sleeve so it's not a full sleeve you're not sleeveless you just have yeah. this little bit of coverage on your shoulders which is really clever and then you've got a wider leg leg on these which I think is just so stylish for summer 
But then again, this is just such a great capsule piece. And then by putting it with just slip on sandals, it makes it look so elegant. But it's something that you can also wear with all the trainers and the jewelry we've had earlier too. Yeah, and, and in winter with... to do with a hoop earring here. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Just to really let the outfit do all the talking. So it's pairing it back a little bit. But again, because of the necklines and all of the kind of more capsule piece element to all of these outfits from Casual Company, you can really just accessorize with, for whatever occasion you need them Ursula for. Ursula was popping the heel in she that look. She was popping there, wasn't yeah. she? Popping, loved it. It was yeah. so good. Uh, Lorna Waitman, all available from the Casual Company. They are indeed. Thank you so much My for that. Pleasure. Cheers. Now, up next, the best makeup to survive any day or night. This, I need this because I can't <laughs> make through the three hours. It's all gone. We'll see you back here very shortly. We're arguing over makeup here, the two of us, from festivals <laughs> to holidays to weddings this summer can be a busy social season. Do you know what? It's all year round. We love a bit of makeup. Men, women, children. Yeah. Great. I was even saying earlier on that I'd see a lot of more men wearing sort of just a foundation and some, Absolutely. some makeup. Yeah. And to help us make sure there's no sweaty upper lips or smudge mascara is makeup artist Aideen Kate Murphy. Good morning. Hi, to you. how are Hello. you? Hello. And is it a thing in the summer that, be, that women especially are going, oh my God, now the heat can't oh, keep the makeup absolutely. on. Absolutely. Like it's very hard to wear makeup in the heat mm. because, you know, if you're a warm person in general, it can tend to melt off your face. Yes. But I'm going to give you some tips to keep it lasting all day. Can I ask for Petra's here and Petra looks fantastic already this morning. <laughs> but can I ask you, when it comes to primers, there's, yes. a, it, there's a big makeup market out there for primer setting sprays and all this kind Absolutely. of stuff. Absolutely, yeah. Are they a good thing? I think it works for some people and it doesn't for others. Me personally, I love just a good, like, a moisturiser. Okay. I just think you can't go wrong with a moisturiser. But I know some people, like you were mentioning, you like a good primer just to really make your makeup stick. So it just depends on your skin type. Okay, depends on skin type mm. and yeah, all that kind of that's stuff. What okay, I would say. <laughs> we're going to start first of all with mascara. Yes, because indeed. with mascara, you've got normal mascara, you've got waterproof mascara, yeah. and water resistant mascara. Yes. What's the difference between waterproof and water resistant? <laughs> okay, so water resistant is if you you know if you if you cry a little bit, it should be okay. But if you rub the mascara, it will come off. Whereas waterproof, it should literally if oh, someone threw a drink your eye, in your face, it shouldn't come you're off. good. Oh, God. Yeah, that's the difference. So We this... need that here because I rub my eye all the time and I end up going home with two big pans of the black yeah. eyes on the <laughs> For the summertime, it's great if, if you tend to like sweat or if you're at a festival, you have an all day event, a waterproof mascara is a really good one to have. Is it's... it more expensive? Um, rough, not really, no. Okay. The price point is more or less. But it is taking it off. Taking it off is a little bit more difficult. Yeah. You just need to use like an oil-based remover. Yes. Oh, right. But it's worth it. Um, it's just really, really good for just making your makeup last, to be honest. And as well, if you find that your mascara tends to like transfer under your eye as the day goes on, a waterproof one is probably better for you. You know use. what I've seen the first time ever on Love Island last night? They were blow drying their eyelashes. Oh, wow. They must have lash extensions. Blow drying. Them. Well, okay, no, no, no. She Tell had me a there. little. What are you about? They said she extension eyelashes, but she was blow drying them. The thing with the with extension a little eyelashes, comb. they actually like because it's like fake hair. You actually do. Do need you to have drop. to? Or the well, they'll drop? I mean, personally, I've never blow dried my eyelashes, but I kind of get it. They they tend to stay wet for quite oh a while. Oh my god! She was crying. This is she amazing. Was blow drying her eyelashes. I'd never I seen them before. It. So <laughs> if you get transfer, you can get transfer underneath. So that would be you need a, a waterproof. Sometimes you get transfer above as yeah. well. Like waterproof will definitely help if you tend to just have like sweaty eyelids or if your lashes are actually very close to your skin. Yeah. A waterproof one would probably Another be Another thing to worry to about. Oh my God, I've got <laughs> sweaty eyelids. eyelids. Like, skin, like some you people... don't have really long ones. Yeah, or like just, just depends on your eye shape. Like it's very okay. dependent on the person's eye shape. Can I ask you, should you ever attempt to reapply mascara over mascara that was done three hours ago? You know, someone asked me this recently and I would always say no, because it's just going to clump. It's not the same as like reapplying like, you know, powder or foundation. Yeah. It's not really going to wear away because you don't tend to like sweat from your but eyelashes. If you buy good mascara, it should last. Anyway, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Okay, so we talked about um, primaries and moisturizers. You're a big fan of a, just a good moisturizer, but when yeah. it comes to foundation, what is it like? What do you need to factor in to make it last the longest? So I think you need to know your own skin type. Okay. So if you have really oily skin, I would stay away from like an oily kind of foundation, product, anything that you're going to put on your, under that. What I like to do sometimes is spray the face with setting spray first because that's going to act as like almost like a glue to the makeup. Okay. Another thing that's really, really good, I think, 
to really just like work the makeup into the skin is a blending sponge. So I would like apply the makeup, say foundation with a brush and then using a sponge, dabbing it into the skin. Like but after so. you've put it on with the brush, do this then. Because what this is gonna do, it's really gonna just like melt everything into your skin. It's gonna take away any of those lines you can see of the foundation. And it really just helps to like work it right into I'm your right face. Into the skin. That's something that I find is a massive difference of making your makeup last because it's not just sitting on your face, it's like worked into your skin. So a sponge, I literally would not go anywhere without this. Oh, I actually wow. I actually created this sponge myself. So it's <laughs> honestly the best sponge ever. I love it so much. And it's just really easy to use. Just wet it under the tap and just pat and it wash the them. Skin. Keep washing wash them. them. Yeah. You can, put them, the in, you can put them in the washing machine. That's what I do. Put them in a little bag, throw all your stuff in the washing machine. Oh, perfect. Oh yeah, grand. Make sure that you're doing all that. Yeah. Um, setting the look, right? Yeah. You mentioned setting spray. You've used yeah. it before. And there's powders, there's translucent powders. Yeah. There's this powder that, what should we be doing? So I personally love a translucent powder. I actually brought a little mini one to show because this is so handy if you want to throw it in your handbag, you know, if you're at a festival, a wedding, anything. So this is just a loose translucent setting powder. Okay, is that the Laura Mercier one? This is the Laura Mercier and one. And is this the one, you, so you can keep applying this throughout the day, can you, can, you? You absolutely can. Like I would avoid caking powder, like, if you don't need to. So what I would do is I just kind of put it on those areas that you know you're gonna get really, really shiny as the day goes on. So for me, it would be like around the nose area and under my eye tends to get really shiny. So you'll know your own face, yeah. what's kind of shiny and what's not. Okay. Um, Again, when I'm doing my makeup, say at home, I'll use a brush, but when I'm on the go, the sponge just comes everywhere with me because you can use this, there's use those that different well. edges. So you I will use... I was in Spain last week and I was using that translucent powder all the time. In the oh, evenings, yeah. yeah. It's to dampen down, it's the dampen shine. down the shine. Because there's no, it's great, there's no it? color in it either. Yeah, there's so no like color, it but matter. it just dampened down any shininess that you'd have on your face. In the because evening. there are different ones, like there's the translucent one, but there's different ones for different skin tones, Absolutely. like across the gamut of whatever yeah. your skin color is. I just stick for a translucent because I just think it works well. Okay. And especially okay. with the Irish now, girls, if you like to wear fake tan and stuff. Exactly. Like the lips. <laughs> yes. What do you so, recommend? For lips. So what I actually think is great for a long lasting staying pair is a lip stain. This is really cool. So I already put this on Petra because you have to let this dry and peel it off. But it's absolutely brilliant to use because it basically just leaves that color on your lips. Dry and peel it off. I know, it Show sounds, a, it sounds a little crazy. So it's actually staining your lips. So it, it looks just like a, like a really aggressive lip color. Yeah. You put it on and then as it dries, you peel it off and it just leaves this beautiful undertone on your lips. Oh, so it's like a little film that's exactly. left on your lips and then exactly. you peel that there film off. there loads of different off. brands? You can, yeah, loads of different brands. This is just one that I, I've tried and tested and I really like it. Um, and then what I'll do is, so I put the lip stain on Petra's lips and then just using a lip gloss on top just to like put add a little bit of sheen. I'm getting a lip stain. Aideen, <laughs> how do people find you? You can find me on Instagram at Aideen Kate and my makeup brand True Beauty is And then you're doing a masterclass in Liffey Valley this uh, Saturday. This Saturday I'm doing two masterclasses, one's at 12pm, one is at 2pm. If you're free, pop over and see me. And money's going to charity. Thank you so yeah. much and thank you Petra. Thank, thank you. you so much. Tommy, what's coming up? Hey guys, yeah, thank you very much. Yes, uh, Daniel O'Donnell is calling in tomorrow. That's going to be a pretty big one. We We're gonna, Daniel. Uh, going to meet the cast of the highly anticipated film Twig, retail of a Greek tragedy set in Dublin's inner city. Yeah, there you go. And Derek, well, can he beat this morning? No. He's going to be channeling his inner animal. Maybe he can. Who All knows? that plus your new sport and weather. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. All the best.